Hey, I'm Robert Pattinson, and I'm going to talk about some of my iconic performances. <laughs> That's so stupid. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Cedric Diggory, the head of the Hufflepuff clan. And he's the first um, death in Harry Potter, which is my claim to fame. <laughs> It was definitely my concept to jump out of the tree, like at the beginning for my intro, which I then kind of repeated later on in Twilight. For some reason, I always have the suggestion to be like, why doesn't he just appear just like jumping out of a tree? I'd sort of fallen into it. I mean, it was so terrifying. I remember the first scene I ever shot on that was in the magical maze at the end, and I'd never done anything with special effects and stunts, and it was a big deal at the time. It felt like very, very intimidating. I think I'd read a book on method acting. The only thing I really got out of that was just beating yourself up before every single scene. That was basically my only concept of how to, how to prepare for a scene. I was psyching myself up as if I was getting into a fight or something before these scenes and just screaming into a pillow and like fighting, punching myself and like kind of ripping my clothing and stuff. But I had all these prosthetic wounds on and all of the prosthetics would melt off my face and I'd have to have all my makeup done again. But I had, I had no concept of how to kind of get into a, a, a psyched up physical state. I remember holding a wand and thinking that it felt so dorky to hold it like a magic wand, so I'm holding it like a gun with two hands, thinking I'm in like a Die Hard movie. I think I even have one eye closed when I'm like looking down like it's got a, it's got a viewfinder on it. I spent a lot of time living off the Harry Potter money. I moved to an apartment in Soho in London. I really thought I was gonna do music at that point. I don't know where I had the kind of belief in that because there was absolutely no one saying that there's a kind of music career on the table. But I was doing a lot of gigs all the time. I was just constantly doing open mics all the time. And then uh, I ran out of money, basically. <laughs> it was definitely going the wrong direction in terms of a career <laughs> up until Twilight. Twilight. I'd started to develop, the, to develop this absolute terror of uh, auditions, which I'm sure a lot of actors have. And I'd kind of, could be so enthusiastic about something and then the day of the audition, just my confidence would just entirely collapse. The same thing happened the morning of uh, the Twilight audition. I used to live on my agent's couch at the time in, in her apartment. And uh, she sent me the email exchange. Which was like, I'm freaking out. I, I don't want to go to the audition anymore. And then underneath it's saying, well, uh, Find find a Valium in my in my bathroom. I'd never taken a Valium before. I was I just remember just feeling so glorious in the in the back of the taxi with the window open and just being like, wow, this is what I've been missing. And so I kind of I think I had this sort of quite spacey, detached kind of thing in the audition, which must have kind of worked for the character. That's Edward Cohen. <laughs> I do think there's something in that first movie. You can see that people are like, we're taking it seriously and it kind of has this, it has, a, it has a passion to it. Everything about me invites you in. My voice, my face, even my smell. You know, I was 21 and kind of wanted to make it as arty as possible. And so I was kind of, we had this strange tension where the studio was kind of a little bit scared to make things a little bit too emo and stuff. And I thought that was the only way to play it. It just seems so ridiculous talking about it now because I was literally in, I, I, I spent so much time just infuriated. Like the whole, I, it's definitely something about being 21 as well. Cause I was, I can't believe like the way I was acting is half the time. Like when I think back on it, the scene, when Edward introduces Bella to his family the first time. I remember that being the day because my agent, my manager, like came up as a surprise visit. And I was like, oh, hey, and just thought everything was fine. And then at lunch, they were like, okay, so whatever you're doing right now, you need, after lunch, just do the opposite or you'll be fired by the end of the day. And I, <laughs> I was like, Okay, and so uh, that was the only thing that got me to sort of smile a little bit. If I tried to play it lighthearted, the way I would do it would end up looking so wrong, like I, that I'd probably end up looking even more like a psychopath. There was this big, like tons of people signing this petition to have me not cast, but nothing about my life really changed until the weekend or maybe like a week before the movie came out. So when the signatures came, it just felt such an abstract, uh, like I just didn't really care. And uh, I was very excited about doing the movie. But yeah, then when it came out, 
it just changed everything so fast. I mean, it was, it was overnight. The Batman. That was no hesitation, yes. Even my agents and stuff were just thought like, oh, this is interesting. I mean, I thought you only wanted to play like, just total freaks all the time. <laughs> like, he is a freak, this is another freak. <laughs> you look for things that kind of scare you, you look for things that feel incredibly out of reach. It's such the kind of, the jewel and the crown of, of characters. You know, you really could be doing more for this city. Your family has a history of philanthropy, but as far as I can tell, you're not doing anything. It's a, just a totally different vibe. I mean, it's sad. It's something which I always thought about Batman. I thought it's really, really sad. It's a tragedy. That's one of the reasons it feels kind of different, because it's kind of, it's like, it's year two, we're not gonna do the origin story again. Instead of him getting over his his parents, his parents dying at, at the beginning, and then just becoming Batman and saving Gotham, now he really hasn't gotten over them at all. And it's kind of, and I basically, I'm playing the parents' death constantly throughout the, the whole time. Riddler's latest, it's all about the Waynes. If we don't stand up, no one will. I always like approaching the kind of major character like that. And if you look at it very literally or like in a, from an emotional context, it does end up coming becoming kind of something kind of strange and, and it's always kind of shocks you what comes out of it. I mean, I didn't really realize how how sad it would make me feel. There's something about his relationship with Selena Kyle as well. And it's it's very present in the graphic novels. I mean, I think a lot of those writers really touched on that. There's ways to reinterpret that character in mean, an infinite number of ways. This is the maybe ninth or tenth Batman movie. And it does feel incredibly different. It's funny, I, I was talking to the other actors who are in the movie and everyone else said like, no, and even Matt was saying like, don't watch the other ones, don't watch any of the other movies, don't be thinking about that kind of stuff too much. But I was like, I've already seen all the other movies and they're incredibly familiar to me. And I like all the other movies. It's not like you're trying to rescue like a dead character. I mean, they're all like really, really good portrayals. And I kind of really watched a lot of them on the uh, the run up up to it to just see where a, where's a gap. Um, and something that hasn't really been explored yet. I think it's also really fun as well doing that because it's like every single person who's played Batman is a pretty um, heavyweight actor and they all had great interpretations of it and, and very, very different. So I, it was fun watching them all. I, I definitely don't have a favorite. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, I think Christian Bale did like just such a, I mean, it's so kind of iconic, like his, the, the voice that he was doing in it, but it's almost impossible to, to, not, to not do that. Where were the other drugs going? I don't know. I swear to God. Swear to me! It's really hard to get into a artificially lower register. I mean, and it was, to, and to do it a long time, because I mean, there's a lot of scenes in this as well where you're kind of, it's long dialogue scenes as Batman, which is quite unique out of um, a lot of the other movies in the series. And trying to kind of stay really, really low and have kind of nuance in the lines and stuff. I mean, it's really hard. It's really, really hard. When that light hits the sky, it's not just a call. It's a warning. I think I was doing vocal exercises without actually knowing they were vocal exercises. I think your larynx or something just got strengthened when I was, I was doing the movie. Fire the gun! When I was doing ADR for it, I mean, I couldn't even do the voice again. I mean, I had to kind of, it had completely reverted back to normal. There's a kind of understanding, which I think every actor who goes into it, there's some way of playing Batman that just feels right as Batman. <laughs> and like, if you try and do something too different, it sometimes feels really off. But it's funny, it's like, as soon as you put on the suit, it sort of does something to you. You start behaving in this quite particular way. And it might be about the kind of restriction and the movement and stuff where there's definitely elements of just the kind of um, practical aspect of it. You don't know how you're gonna feel until you put on the suit. And then just because this suit was a little bit more articulated, because I'd done the audition in, I think it was George Clooney's one, and it was incredibly difficult to move in. Well, I'm totally over, all right, positively. Me too, definitely. You had to choose the suit by the size of your head, and I think my, my head was about, was the closest to, to Clooney's head. Was your head like locked? It's locked and you're boiling hot, like absolutely boiling. If you have any lights on you, you're just pouring sweat. 
And then as I was doing it, and, and you're also doing an audition, so I'm kind of t- terrified anyway. And people are saying, what can we do about this sweat? I mean, you're thinking like, if I don't stop sweating, I'm not gonna get the part. And so you're, like trying to, you're trying to shut down your body a little bit. If I'm not mistaken, that's the one with the nipples, isn't it? It is, but then me, I, I keep getting confused with, cause I think there might be two nipple suits. <laughs> I think I, I think one has just more one has more prominent nipples. I think on the Val Kilmer suit as well. There's I think there's some nipples on that. Maybe, there might be just be one nipple. <laughs> Good time was uh, another wonderful experience, and also a totally unexpected reaction to it as well. I remember talking to Josh and Benny at some hotel in LA. And I said, I want to do whatever you guys are doing next, I want to do it. And I remember Josh saying, do you mean that? Because I'll have a script in six weeks and, uh, and, and like, we'll do it. And then the f- first iteration of Good Time came after six weeks and it was unbelievable. I mean, they're great directors, but I love the way they write so much. Excuse me. You Peter? Yes, I am. We're in the middle of, Nick, hello. Nick, what, what are you doing? We're in the middle of something here. We're in the middle of the exam. Hey, hey, Nick, Nick. about the stuff and the the pan and the chicken. Wait, 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 please. How would you like it if I made you cry? How would you like that? Benny is also just a phenomenal actor as well. I mean, he just stayed in the character like all day and would kind of slightly change his voice when he had to kind of suggest something to Josh. It really felt like a character talking. Benny would be doing a scene with me. He was also operating the boom at the same time. So he's like holding, he's holding the boom between us. It is definitely the definition of run and gun filmmaking. Nick, Nick, come here. Stay with me. Where'd he go? Where are you? Is he in the bank? You're circling around. I'm on the corner. I'm on the corner where you dropped me off. You gotta get back here right now. I wasn't really like trying to perfect an accent. It's just something that felt right. It's just it's all just trying to do everything in an intuitive way. And it's weird, because I, I mean, it, it does sound like a Queen's, <laughs> specific Queen's accent, but it was kind of, uh, it wasn't, I wasn't really doing it in a very academic way. It was much more just like, just feeling your way through it, I think. Well, there's two lines that were just probably my fa- two favorite lines I think I've ever said in the movie, which is, the one was uh, when I was saying to, to Leah, Don't be confused. It's just gonna make it worse for me. I don't know anyone else apart from Josh who would ever come up with that line. And then the line, I'm talking about the kind of metaphysical connection with, with Talia, and then at the end of it, it just undercuts it saying like, all right, I'm just gonna take a shit in that guy's house. Okay, I'm gonna go and take a shit in that guy's house. I'm gonna try the hospital again in a minute. Just wait here for me, okay? It's just a very, very specific feeling, which I, the only other person I've ever seen that in a, in a script with is, is The Lighthouse um, with uh, Robert Eggers. <laughs> Lighthouse, I play a character called Thomas Winslow. Um, uh, no, that's not even his name. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Thomas <laughs> Howard. <laughs> yeah, he's a little bit confused about his identity. He's, he's kind of, he's a little bit Ephraim, Ephraim Winslow and uh, Thomas Howard. <laughs> that's, I love The Witch, um, uh, Robert's previous movie. I really wanted to find something with him. I thought he's a very, very special director. I had such a good time on Good Time and I wanted to swing wildly the other direction, but I wanted everything to be strange. And I kind of said to Robert, I only want to do strange things. And Robert came back with The Lighthouse and said, if this isn't strange enough for you, then um, I don't think I'm capable of anything stranger than this. <laughs> really trying to convince everyone that The Lighthouse was a comedy and trying to convince, I think it was the God, the, the HFPA, like I'm really, really trying, to, trying to convince the relatively elderly people. No, it is a comedy. It's, it's 100% a comedy. It should qualify for the musical or comedy section. <laughs> and everyone had watched this incredibly dark movie and thinking like, uh, I don't know how much of a comedy it is. But then I see the audience is watching it and and people do, like, people laugh so much more than I ever would have thought. I mean, I thought it was hilarious when I read the script. But yeah, I'm, I'm always quite stunned about the, the reaction to it. And also how much people like sea shanties. I mean, I, like, that is, I, I had absolutely no idea. I remember seeing the first screening and everyone's like bobbing their heads like they're at a concert whenever a sea shanty came on. I'm like, wow, like, how did Eggers know that that was going to be a trend? And, 2018, I mean, it's like, that is out of the blue. And it's funny, because everyone's like, oh, what accent are you doing, blah, blah, blah. I always get these strange, unfounded criticisms about my accents. But there's this area in Maine, which I guess of how the immigration worked there, 
it was a kind of a, like Devon or Dorset accents in England, and then mixed with a bit of like certain types of American accents. And then there was like a kind of weird elements of like Liverpudlian and all, I guess all the different sailors that have come there. But you kind of listen to this really tiny area in Maine and it's been the same accent for hundreds of years and it doesn't sound anything like a normal um, American accent. But it's very, very fun. It's also very addictive to do. A lot of the, it's, uh, a lot of the crew started uh, speaking, being like, thank you, and like all these different things. I don't have to say nothing. Danny! Let Neptune strike ye dead, Winslow! Oh! Eggers said, when I asked him how the movie was, um, he he said like, well, it's basically Willem going, arr, 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 and you going like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great, sounds, sounds great. Only when he crowned in cockle shells, his coral tine trident screeches banshee-like in the tempest and Plunge us right through your gullet! It was absolutely great working with Willem. We rehearsed uh, for about a week before we started shooting, and he has so much energy, it's just unreal. It's like almost like working with like a six year old. Like, kind of, they just have kind of, <laughs> there's nothing that fatigues him. And, uh, and so I was kind of a little bit terrified at the beginning because he would literally, we'd rehearse the entire movie. And then the second we got to the end, he's like, again! <laughs> and I just start doing it again. And, I, and he hasn't, his energy hadn't even been dented. He's the best. What? What? The scene where we're saying what to each other, we're just going what, 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 what. I just remember seeing that in the script. It was over three pages where everyone's line was just, it was just saying what, 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 what. And you're looking at it going like, this can't be, actually in a script. It's one of those things where you go, I'm not gonna see this again, ever in my entire life, and I want to be the person to say this, because I'd be really, really annoyed if someone else gets to do it. Tenet. It's the most apocalyptic spy movie that's ever been made. They're really, really big concepts, but it's kind of, it's, it's like all of Chris's movies. You can kind of interpret them. You can either like really, really dig into it and find so many different threads to, to pull. Or you can kind of appreciate it as like a big, massive adventure action movie and you don't really need to know what's happening like that much. <laughs> It's so complicated to make the story work. You just thought, this, this is it's so insane, this is even happening. I mean, we're in Estonia. They'd made a car where they'd switched the, the engine, rather. There, there was a driver driving it with the back wheels at the front for him, and me and John David are pretending to drive it backwards. But with about 700 cars all driving in reverse around us, I mean, it was like one of the most exciting theme park rides you've ever been on in your life. And then you're trying to, trying to do a, uh, a scene at the same time. I mean, it was, I, I, I don't think they're gonna be making movies like that ever again. Cosmopolis. Cosmopolis is about a 28-year-old uh, asset manager called Eric Packer. He gets a kind of obscure death threat and he starts to kind of intentionally unravel his own life. I remember doing it and thinking, the audience I want for this is for someone in 10 years time to be watching TV at three o'clock in the morning and this comes on and then you have no idea if you're asleep or not. This is loss of faith that will force the yuan to drop. Dollar will settle up. The yuan will drop. Where's Chin? Working on visual patterns. We were shooting inside a limo that was the same size as a normal limo. It was kind of, and it, the camera's on a techno cranes. I've never done a movie like it where you just, you're doing an entire movie inside like um, a kind of vocal recording booth almost. Like it was very, very strange. And it just got to the point by the end of the shoot, I'd never even left the limo. I just stayed in it all day. I love that movie. I've seen it so many times and I, I think it's really, I think it's one of my favorite things I've ever done. Highlight. Realize nothing is ever gonna go inside us. 
Break the laws of nature. You'll pay for it. Claire Deneen, who directed that, is just one of my favorite people in the entire world. If anyone can experience what it's like to do a Claire Denis movie, I would definitely say you've got, you have to do it. But it's completely different to anything else. You just suddenly realize you can, you can approach filmmaking and acting in, in, in totally different ways every single movie. Um, and directors like that really allow you the freedom to do it. Hmm. It's the first strawberry. So fun. I mean, it was my friend's kid. Um, it's my, my goddaughter. <laughs> We'd cast, because they normally cast identical twin babies for that kind of situation. And, uh, and the night before the shoot started, I went to meet the babies, and the babies wouldn't have anything to do with me at all and would just scream whenever I came anywhere near them. And I tried to kind of bond with them for about four hours, and it was just nothing but terror coming out of them. And it was supposed to be this kind of, like, you know, quite sweet relationship <laughs> they had with my daughter in it. And I got my friend Sam, and I was like, what are you doing for the next two weeks? Like, can uh, Scarlett just <laughs> play my daughter in a movie? And they flew out the next morning, and... Uh, and I think I'd only ever met Scarlett like once or twice when she was a young, young baby, but it worked out perfectly. My old man can see me now. Break the laws of nature. And you'll pay for it. GQ Hunt of them. This is my fortress of solitude. Anonymous couch, anonymous room, anonymous hotel. A gauntlet of trolls. <laughs> Classic performances. Um, I love that thing. I think it's really funny. <laughs> That's like, I think that was the entire thing from conception to completion was about an hour and a half. <laughs> like just, uh, uh, or maybe maybe two hours at the max. I remember my manager saying after that, you should do a TV series of this. And I'm like, of what? <laughs> there is no TV. <laughs> like, so you want me to end my career? Um, but yeah, it was really fun. I know what I should do to promote this movie. Just do a thing about <laughs> eating a hot dog. <laughs> like, and losing your mind. You can call me Rob, I eat hot dogs. The Rover. <laughs> what you doing with this car? It's my brother's car. Where's your brother? Where is he? It's funny with acting stuff, the director who just sees something in you that you don't really know you have and kind of shows trust and belief in you. You can take a risk and it just, um, and people trust you for a bit. And it just, it felt like a very important movie. Just like really just sort of sink into a character. It really felt like, but I could stay in it all day. Like I really, really felt, there's something about the environment of where we're shooting at the Outback. It just felt like there was almost no sign of a film crew anywhere. I mean, it was just one of the most immersive experiences. Also beautifully written as well. I can't tell you nothing more than already told. But I give a shit what you think you've already told me. Start fucking talking to me! The fact that I'm still getting jobs, like, <laughs> Like that just, just kind of blows my mind like every, every single day. I don't quite understand. I think I by accident sold my soul, but I get so excited about it. There's not even a single element of me which is like jaded about it at all. It's the great thing about acting as a job as well, but you always think there is all the insecurity about not having, you know, being unemployed like 90% of the time, but it has the potential to completely change your life. Like every single time. It's very exciting. No matter how small the movie is, I mean, it can kind of, you can have this kind of, it can be this certain kind of explosion in your reality.